Hi class and welcome to this screencast over Mendelian genetics. So we've already looked at mitosis and meiosis and especially with meiosis we looked at how within our own bodies we are combining chromosomes from our own parents in order to create our gametes. So if we're a male we're creating sperm, if we're female we're creating eggs. But now we need to look at how those genes are actually going to be passed on to those gametes on the chromosomes. What laws govern that? And the scientist that we're really going to look at today is a guy named Gregor Mendel. And he was actually a monk, and he uh, studied a garden piece. And we call him the father of genetics because of all of the amazing things that he did with his work on peas. One of the reasons why he used garden peas was that they were really easy to breed. He could self-fertilize them. He could easily fertilize them with each other. They had short generation time, so he was able to quickly see what the generations looked like. And the second reason was that they had several traits, at least seven, that were either or traits. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at a picture. Picture. So these are just some of the traits of peas. Who knew that peas had all these traits, right? Well, when you when you look at the seeds, they're either round or they're um, these sort of wrinkled or shriveled. They're either yellow or green. When peas actually grow, they turn into flowers. And so the flowers are either purple or white. And so all of these traits are either or. So there's no little in between. So these are very discrete traits and characteristics that Mendel was able to very easily follow through several generations. So let's take a look at what he actually did and look at his experiments. I'm going to take you through step by step. So first he had his first generation, which he called the parental generation. So he took a purple flower plant and he took a white flower plant. He sort of mated them and he saw what the offspring looked like. And he found that the first generation, which we call the F1, that first generation was all purple flowers. So he's thinking, where did that white color go? So then, and, and I don't know how, what genius of him thought about doing this, he self-fertilized. So he took these two purple flowers, he mated them to get a F2 generation. And look what he found in the F2 generation. Much to his surprise, and imagine this is like 1850, and he sees this white flower come out in this second generation. So he is floored. He is yet now he needs to figure out how this white flower came back. It disappeared in this generation, and it came back in this generation. Um, and so we're going to look at what he what he thinks or why this happened. So let's take a look at the parental generation. The parental generation we come to find out is true breeding. Now this is important. True. True, true breeding means that they are homozygous for that trait. So both chromosomes, remember, you get one from mom and one from dad. Well, both of those have the same version of the gene or the same allele. For, so for example, the purple flower was big P, big P, and the white flower was little P, little P. They were homozygous, true breeding. Now the F1 he found was all purple. And why was that? Well, on the next uh, slide, we're going to see why that was. And then the F2, we always saw with his experiments, with the true breeding parents and the self-fertilizing F1, in the F2, you always see a 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white. So 3 purple to 1 white, 3 dominant to 1 recessive. Remember that ratio. That's going to really help you in future problems uh, with genetics. So what we just showed was an example of a mono-hybrid cross. We were just following one trait. We were following the trait of flower color. Um, and the way that we can easily visualize this is by using a Punnett square. So let's take a look at how uh, he did the parental, how he made it the parental in order to get that F1. So here's the Punnett square. Now on one side we're going to have the sperm because remember I said the Punnett square is a way to show how gametes fertilize each other. So these are the white sperm, so these are little peas. I know it's hard to tell, but these are little peas and these, these are the parental white flower. And then on top here I have the egg, so this is the big pea. Uh, these are the purple flowers. Well when you cross them you simply bring this down and this over and so what you get is big pea, little pea. And again down and over and big pea, little pea. So when you fill all of that in, you get all of them are big P, little P. Now how do I know that that parental flower is going to give a big P here and a big P here? Well, this is a law that Gregor Mendel uh, stated. It's called the law of segregation. So what this says is that alleles on the two different chromosomes are going to separate into different gametes. So that purple flower had a big P and a big P, but they're going to separate from each other. 
And you should remember when that happens. That happens during meiosis one and meiosis two, right? When they separate from each other. When the homologous chromosomes separate, and I remember when the sister chromatids separate. That's all the law of segregation is saying. So this Punnett square shows us how we get that F1 generation. The F1 generation are all heterozygous purple. Heterozygous might be a new vocabulary word. That just simply means it's got one big P, one little P, one dominant, and one recessive allele. Okay, moving on, how did Mendel get the F2 generation? Well, what he did to get the F2 generation, like I said earlier, was to self-fertilize the F1 plants with each other. And so when you do that, let's set up our Punnett square again. So on this side, we've got our uh, parental purple, so big P, little p. And up here, we've got big P, little p. And again, when we bring down and across all of our P's, we're going to get one big P, big P, we're going to get two big P, little p, and we're going to get one little p, little p. So what this shows you is the three to one ratio. These three guys are all purple because they have at least one big P. This is two big P's, but these have the one big P. And this guy is our white because it has no big P. So again, this is showing the F2 generation. We took the F1, the big P's and the little P's, and we self-fertilized them to get the F2. So as always, the F2 shows that three to one ratio. Now just some vocabulary as we go through that I'll be saying, the word genotype. Genotype is simply the genetic makeup of an organism. So for the examples that we've been using, um, a genotype of that uh, true breeding purple flower is big P, big P. The genotype of that heterozygous F1 purple flower is big P, little p. And the genotype of that parental white flower is little p, little p. So it's just writing down the alleles. Now the phenotype is actually what you see. It's the physical characteristics that you can identify. So the only two possible phenotypes in the example that we just did was purple or white. So uh, three purple to one white. That was a phenotype ratio. Now if we were to look back and do a genotype ratio of this one, the genotype ratio would be one to two to one because we've got one of these we have two of these guys and we have one of these guys. So you can have both a phenotype ratio, three to one, and a genotype ratio, one, two to one. All right, now I think I've got an example for you to do in your notes. Show the Punnett square for a cross between a person with freckles whose heterozygous is dominant because having freckles is dominant. So being uh, having freckles is the phenotype and being heterozygous dominant is the genotype. And you're gonna cross that person with no freckles. So you gotta figure out what their genotype is. Show the Punnett square, and then give the ratios of the offspring, both genotype and phenotype ratios. Okay, we're gonna spend the second half of this video now looking at pedigree analysis. So pedigrees are a great way to show the inheritance of a trait in a family through multiple generations. And as we go through, and as you go through life, it's really important to know how some commonly diseases, how some common diseases uh, are inherited. So I'm just going to show you three or four here. The first one is sickle cell anemia. This is a recessive uh, disease. What recessive simply means is that you need two little, two little recessive alleles in order to have it. If you just have one, you're not, you're not affected by the disease. So for example, little s little s, you need two of those in order to fully show sickle cell anemia. What happens with sickle cell anemia is the red blood cells actually sickle, and because of that, they sort of clog the arteries. Um, you don't get a lot of oxygen to your, to your tissues, you're tired a lot, uh, and we'll learn more about that in class. Another commonly inherited disease is phenylketonuria, also called PKU. And the next time you look at a Diet Coke can, you're gonna notice that you see something on there called, with this little thing, phenylketonurics contains phenylalanine. These people cannot digest uh, this molecule phenylalanine. This again is also a recessive. Um, achondroplasia, dwarfism, is a dominant disease, in fact. So you only need one big A in order uh, to have achondroplasia. And this is an example of an old-time actress, actually, who uh, had dwarfism. And the last one that's also surprisingly dominant is polydactyly. Polydactyly is the idea that you have six fingers. So this is a very interesting thing. This is dominant. I don't know about you, but I think all of us might probably have five fingers and five toes. That's actually a recessive trait. So just because something is dominant does not mean that it's more common in the population. This is actually a dominantly inherited disease, having six fingers. 
So here's an example of a, of a pedigree that shows um, a recessively inherited disease. Now what I really want to point out to you here is that both parents are actually carriers. And this is another definition we need to know. Carriers are heterozygous. So with a recessively inherited disease, they don't show the disease, they don't have the disease, but they do have that allele that they could pass on. So here you see the dad has a little r and the mom has a little r. So when they mate, and they might not have four children, they might have ten children, they might only have one children, but this is the probability, right? Uh, doing these Punnett squares are all about the probability of their offspring. So one-fourth chance of having a totally unaffected big R, big R, uh, half of a chance, two out of four chance of having carrier children who are heterozygous, and then only one-fourth of a chance that their child will be affected with that disease. So here's some notation that you're going to need to know for our pedigree practice in class. Go ahead and draw this in your notes and then label everything. So circles identify the female and males always identify are identified by a square. The line in between them is going to signify a marriage and the line coming off of them and then in between are the siblings and the children. If it's filled in, that tells you that that person is affected by the disease. And if it's not filled in, you know that that person is not affected by the disease. So here's the example that I want you to draw in your notes. I know it'll take a little bit of time, but draw that in your notes. And then I want you to analyze it. Is this disease inherited dominantly or recessively? How do you know? Now, here's how you're going to answer that question. You're going to go back to this slide here, and you're going to use this information about carriers to help you answer that question. Once you figure out whether it's dominant or recessive, try to label as many genotypes as possible. And why don't we all use what's an easy one to identify? Let's all use big A for the dominant and little a for the recessive. So we're all using the same uh, notation here. And we'll look at this the next time we see each other in class.